I'm just really honored to introduce him. Uh, uh, I was going to end my introduction with Bill needs no introduction, because that's indeed true, uh, but I couldn't avoid uh, that. He's had, Here we go. he's had really a tremendous impact on design and on HCI. Uh, so I want to give you a little background about Bill. Uh, he was, uh, he got his first degree, he studied electronics, math, and photography at St. Lawrence College in Kingston. Uh, his undergraduate degree is in music from Queens. Uh, his instrument was the tenor sax. Uh, and uh, he moved uh, from there to the Institute of Sonology in the Netherlands, uh, to, where they took classes in studio technique, compositional theory, computer composition, linguistics, and uh, electroacoustics and psychoacoustics. Uh, and he came back then to Toronto, to Canada, uh, to be artist in residence uh, at the lab of the Dynamic Graphics Project. Uh, and if you know anything about HCI, the Dynamic Graphics uh, uh, Project has had a tremendous influence. And Bill was there, I think in the very early days. I think Ron and other folks had just started the lab. But he came as an artist in residence, as a musician. Uh, and that began a long association with the DGP uh, for Bill. Uh, and uh, during that period, he built one of the first digital synthesizers. Uh, and, uh, and somehow they talked him into becoming a, a graduate student in computer science. And, uh, and, and Bill reports that uh, he didn't even have the background to be an entering undergrad in computer science, but starting in graduate school uh, had this real benefit of support and money. Uh, and, uh, and to quote from him, this is a quote, the reality is that I went to graduate school for the money. It beat working in a bar or restaurant. I never had any intention of becoming a researcher. I just wanted to make my instrument and then go back to becoming a full-time musician. Uh, and uh, during his career, uh, unfortunately, he failed at this. Uh, not that he's not a good musician, but he surely became a researcher. Uh, and he's worked at uh, just amazing places. In the early, early days of Xerox Park, he was one of the people that led the establishment of Euro Park, this thing that spun off from Park. In England, uh, he was chief scientist at Alias Wavefront. He was chief scientist at uh, Silicon Graphics at SGI, uh, and and now he's a principal researcher uh, at, at Microsoft Research. Uh, he has multiple honorary degrees uh, from around the world. Uh, he has many awards. I could list them forever. He was the first recipient of the Grand Canadian Digital Media Pioneer Award. He's been written up in Business Week as one of the most influential designers. He's a fellow of the ACM. He's co-recipient of an Academy Award. Uh, you don't know there's a whole other set of Academy Awards that for some reason they don't televise. Uh, these kind of technical awards. Uh, and he received that for, uh, for the Maya software from Alias. Uh, He's the uh, tenth person to receive the SIGCHI Lifetime Research Award. Uh, Don was the fourth. I was the seventeenth. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I could go on and on. But in every introduction, I always try to come up with some personal things about the person that, uh, that you know, you, you probably don't know about Bill, and Bill might not know that I know about Bill. Uh, and... Uh, uh, he has a, a twin sister. Uh, his father was a preacher. Uh, he's really mad about climbing. He's totally mad about all the outdoor activities. He's very interested in the early, early explorers in Canada, the Voyagers. Uh, he played ice hockey for the Dutch national team. He speaks Dutch. Uh, he was in a band, I think, called Machine Reasoning. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, he built his own birch bark canoe. Uh, he was in training to be an equestrian writer for the Olympics. Uh, he tells terrible jokes, uh, awful puns. Uh, he built a multi-touch interface in the late 80s. Uh, he loves his Avanti car. Uh, 
He's married to an amazing artist and is a doting grandfather. Uh, but the thing I admire absolutely most about Bill uh, is just his love for ideas, and especially his advocacy of the central importance of appreciating the, the history of ideas. Uh, I think for me, ideas are like people, and you can only fully understand them in the, in the context of their history. And, and Bill has brought to many of us the importance of that uh, in looking at design and, and the history of HCI. Uh, I've surely run on too long, but uh, he's going to tell us about intelligent design and design for intelligence. <coughs> Thanks. I was worried. I told him that if you know if you wanted me back, he had to be careful what he said. So, so let's jump into this. So it's just fortunate for you that Saul Greenberg is in a cabin without good internet contact. He was sending me all kinds of pictures that I could have used. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So here we go. And we don't have a clicker, so actually, I'll invent one so I can wander around a bit. So my title you'll see around here is, um, it turns out there's these sharks circling, and they're circling our field. And um, they're in a feeding frenzy. And it's sort of vague, it's amorphous, we can't quite get focus on it. And those sharks are AI. And we're the food, we're getting eaten, and we're called design, and uh, user-centered design. And uh, I, I don't want to, I can't teach you about AI, I can't teach you about psychology, and I probably can't teach you about design, but I can tell you what I'm seeing and what I'm feeling and what's keeping me awake at night. And I thought this is a good place to do this the first time in public because I, in some of the stuff, because um, the story about Don is that uh, one of his PhD students, who's now a good friend of both of ours, Abby Sellen, I, I think she saw me give a talk and, about a study I'd done. And as she tells it, he, she came and said, this, I, there's this guy, Buxton, he doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. He knows nothing about psychology, experimental design, it's just pathetic. And he's doing this stuff, and, and, and she's, the way she said, well, Don, Don pat her on the head, it's okay, Abby, just wait, give him some time, he'll grow up, and, <laughs> and it's worth the wait. And, and hopefully um, this will help uh, convince you that that might be somewhat the case. But what we do want to do here is, within this frenzy, um, have our inner Buddha uh, emerge so that we can all be, uh, find our place within our profession and where we fit within this feeding frenzy. And, and I went to... Uh, I, I might have to turn this captioning off. It's there for a reason. Um, uh, I went to the Journal of Record um, for most of America, namely USA Today, Mac Paper. And on the same day, in, in uh, December 8th uh, last year, it was fantastic in the money section. These two articles were side by side, symmetrically. And I'll just dive in a bit deeper. So you can read them. Um, let me kill the captioning. I've made the point, sort of. <laughs> that um, the first one is that now you can have self-driving cars lifts in as of December in the Boston area. And some of you, I'm looking at Don, might have some comments about um, whether that's premature or not. But this article is even more interesting because it's actually saying that during the, at the same time as this, the LA fires were going on and the intelligent navigation systems are so intelligent to understand traffic that they're gonna do you a favor and take you out of the traffic onto the roads that are empty so you can get there faster, and they're taking you straight into the fire where either you're gonna get burnt to a crisp or you're blocking the, uh, the first responders. But not a good thing. 
The fact that this is happening and reported in the same newspaper as that on the same page, I'm, it cannot be that the editors were understood that those were the same story. They're just repeating press releases and calling that journalism. Which is why I t mentioned earlier to some of you that from time to time maybe we should ourselves do less journal publications and, and try and balance that in terms of the, this particular outlet. But it is really fascinating in terms of what's actually going on here because in some senses the good news is there's, there's some progress. Um, we not, may not think it's in a good direction but it's, it's better, if you are going to have a self-driving car, they're better than they were, but um, living in Canada where you can't see the roads, I still don't believe it. But the, um, in the winter. Uh, but this one says, they're smart within, it's, it, here's what it is. It's science, it's bounded intelligence. We know about that in people. And, and, the, and the degrees of boundedness are really small. And I think that a, I, I kind of said to the students the other day, I said, stop calling smartphones smartphones. Call them less stupid phones, or smarter than the previous ones, maybe. But if you think they're smart, then your standards of what's smart, um, you're setting the bar way too low for yourselves and, and, and the same thing. And I'd say here, um, what's the bounded nature of intelligence? And if that's implied to be like, well, hey, we beat somebody in chess or go, it must be the whole deal. Um, that's concerning because actually, they're not smarter than people. Um, it's sort of like David Letterman's, it's, it's, it's not like David Letterman's stupid pet tricks, but, but there's this notion that there's limitations here that are implicit and most people don't have the tools or information to understand them. And therefore there's chances for not, not so good things necessarily happen. So the question here about the boundedness has to do with context. And if I, this is probably the rule that I repeat the most, uh, and I feel the most strongly about, and because it brings a whole bunch of baggage in, in a positive sense. Everything is best for something and worst for something else. And, this, and the corollary that would be, and the difference between a wise person and a fool is, their of, is whether they know the who, what, where, when, why, and how of, of that. And it comes to what I say you call uh, one side of Buxton's 360 rule. If you do not understand equally the full 360 from good to bad and in between, you are not qualified or equipped to make a choice, to advocate for adoption or rejection. You are, you're qualified to enumerate. But you have to do that and you have to do it for each thing. And, and, and the con conduct of design is to studios and the whole notion of the stru social structure of critique is to have this non-controversial enumeration of multiple ideas, put them on the board, and then you can make a much more informed decision. But, it, but the 360 rule works in other dimensions as well as design, so as we're going to say. So it, it works with people as well. So here's the thing about the 360 rule and everything's best or every one is best for something or worse for something else in terms of people. And this is um, captured in this graphic that uh, my son did for me, which is the case of the proverbial deer trapped in the headlights. The dirty little secret of highly accomplished people is what they've had to neglect to become highly accomplished. Um, it is a full-time job to be world-class at something. And therefore, you've had to neglect. Now, one of the consequences in HR, whether you're hiring a team for a research project, for a product, or for a company, or whatever, the last person you should hire is the person you're most qualified to hire. Because the person you're most qualified to hire is yourself, because you know that cold, if you're really good. And what you need to do is hire the person that fills in the gaps. Because meanwhile, the challenge is, is that you're so brilliant at what you do that you're blind and you can't see the gaps because the gaps that are in my background, you have I, no idea because any normal person would know those things and I don't. And I have to feel that. And the, and the dangerous people are the ones who actually believe their own, uh, smoke their own fumes and believe you've, I've got so much positive reinforcement of how brilliant I am that I think my brilliance goes to full 360. It never does. And, and therefore, you have to take that into account. So the challenge about putting a team together for any design project is figuring out where are the gaps, where are the shadows, and how do I populate them before I, I, I get redundancy in my own skill set. And that means you have to find out who to ask, ask to find out who to ask, who knows who, what to ask the person. 
it's kind of that kind of uh, complexity. But, but this, is, this is a really important thing. And when you go on this 360, you also understand every one of these decisions, if you say good, bad, those words immediately come with a, a, a question of what's the moral compass? And the, what are the ethics? And so we understand every decision we make is in fact an ethical or value judgment. It's, it's not an arbitrary, um, you need to say that. So this notion about this limitations, and I'm gonna jump into the old uh, T-shaped uh, uh, persona, but try and do a little bit of animation and, and try and bring a bit of perspective to a, a slightly different reading than is often used. But, so here's the old uh, T-shaped thing, uh, Bill Margaret and lots of other people before him uh, populated. But the key thing this says is that what does it actually mean? The breadth of the bar is your breadth of intelligence and our, our expertise. And this is the depth. And what I just said about the dirty little secret is you absolutely can have broad literacy, but you cannot have broad depth. And one of the major confusions we make I think in terms of ourselves sometimes or others, is we confuse literacy and enthusiasm with depth. And it's sort of like how many people, so um, yet, no I don't yet uh, have the qualifications to get into first year in computer science at the University of Toronto, but yes I am a professor of computer science at the University of Toronto and a fellow of the ACM, so go figure that. But, but the point is, is that um, the in computer science people come up and they say, well I'm a computer programmer, I know, and, and I say, that's great. Um, what does that mean? Because you know what? I taught first year computer science, 13 weeks, you can come out, you know, with stacks and queues, linked lists and all that sort of stuff are, you can do algorithms, you can do binary search, you can do all kinds of searches, and you can program, yes. So now tell me, for the people who actually I need, what they were doing for the next four years for their undergraduate degree, and for the next two years of their masters, the next five years, are you all the same? And there's levels of expertise. And I'm not saying, I'm not discounting this versus that. They're all good, but that's where this line gets blurred and causes problems in terms of all these disciplines. And the hardest thing is when you're trying to deal with something you don't know about, like um, whether it's designers in, with respect to uh, how engineers understand, what, how they evaluate designers or vice versa. Those are really hard questions and they're really important ones. But the key thing is, is that when we come from this, we can actually label the T. And the trick I play now to, this comes back to an old conversation with Don, he just doesn't know it, but if we, what I'd say within my world, I have three T's, and they're the three pillars, business experience and design, this, uh, and technology. And of course it's recursive, like the, these uh, Ukrainian dolls that are self, so you can go take this at higher and lower levels. But, but it, in, at Microsoft's level, this, this is what you have to do. If, if you don't have these things in equal balance, but the trick is when you animate them and you see, because you've done that, you've got the combined, combined breadth if you've designed the social structures well enough, but also what happens is the overlaps of the T's gives you the common ground, which gives you the common language so you can actually start to communicate. Because the critical thing is, it's not sufficient to have three silos. No matter how much you enjoy drinking beer together, you have to have equal amounts of, um, of creativity and flexibility and respect for what you don't know as well as what you do. The trick about the people you want to know is they really can articulate. Don't ask people, what are you really good at? What are you really bad at? What don't you know? And who would you go to fill in that gap? And, and so when we come into this whole space, and by the way, this thing, um, Evan, wherever you are, animate this for me, because this should wrap around now so that, that bar overlaps like that, so you've got the full 360. But I'm pathetic, so I can't do it. Um, it's one of the things I can't do. Right? And I don't apologize for it, I acknowledge it and I'm aware of it. <laughs> and, and so, okay, so the, here's the deal. Um, here's AI. It is absolutely essential. It's doing really amazing things. What we're capable of doing now compared to the early days, you know, Three Rivers and, the, it's, and so on, expert systems and so on. And there's been a burst and it's been a long time coming. It's hit this uh, hockey stick uh, thing. It's not clear that it's sustainable, and one of the things that we all have to understand is that when you have these rapid uh, bursts and this huge, uh, it builds some inertia, but all bubbles burst. And, and, and the real question is, if you ask AI people, would be, why do you believe this is sustainable? 
and of the cur current things of, say, deep learning and so on and so forth, is that sufficient to be sustaining and take, fill in the gaps that are needed for, to achieve what people are talking about? And it's not clear to me that that is, but, but it's a legitimate question. So the, you can't believe the marketing or the hype. You have to start to think, be, we have to develop our critical thinking resources. But if AI is clearly there, but it, um, there's these other pieces to the puzzle and it's really important, that like, just like with the T's, that each one of these is essential, but none of them are sufficient on their own. And, none of them, and, 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 so, and they're all important pieces of the puzzle. And you could call them each one of these one of the T's. But what I worry about and what I predict is that the companies or the organizations that have the, invested the most in the dollar wars and the, in the battles about AI the companies that have the best AI technology risk being beaten by somebody who's got 20% of that capability, but with way, they've invested in all of the requisite components that are necessary to really succeed and have it integrate into the larger ecosystem of users and technologies. And so, but there's some real social problems that happen here because if in the, in the price competition, you've got people that are way less qualified than you getting paid double what you are because it's a, it's, a, it's a seller's market, generates resentments, and you have people moving around these organizations, and somehow you've got to manage that within the research, within education, because every part is essential and have to be balanced for any other one. So the, what the key thing, and that's partially what I'm doing here, is to say for those of you who are in design, do not necessarily feel the pressure to go in and become an AI expert because the AI experts need you to be a design expert but you need the literacy, and vice versa. And that thing works around. But, and this is just a, a tiny part of the puzzle. The puzzle is actually much larger, and everybody could have their own version of populating it and where the adjacencies are, and anyhow a flat planar isn't probably the right geometry. The point is, it's a really complicated puzzle, and depending on what problem you're doing, you're gonna organize the puzzle differently. That's the most important thing to design, is, a, is basically the framing of, of, of your process and, 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 and how you think about it. But the main point is, you have to have this holistic approach. And, and in some sense, um, it's clear that no individual can have all those skills. Uh, the Renaissance is over. A Renaissance man or woman is no longer possible. And by the way, the Renaissance never was possible. There never was Renaissance man or woman. If the Renaissance really was, the really was a Renaissance man or woman, why did Leonardo need the Medici? Why did he do his own banking? And, or, and vice versa. Now, I'm, I'm, obviously, it, it's a stupid question, but it's just I'm trying to provoke the thought that even then you needed people with different expertise in order to support yourself. Donatello could not have succeeded and be, being called out unless the Medici, one of them went into the studio that he was working as a, as a, as a backroom person, and recognized the talent and then elevated them and supported them. And, and that has always been the case, even in the Renaissance. But Renaissance team absolutely is possible. This, this heterogeneous social network with the right organization, and of course, the, the, the stutter at the front is intentional because of the T's, right? Um, the only thing is they should all know animate and locate, but you, I need to leave some power for the imagination. But the thing I, I was saying here about this two-way street is the fundamental thing about the social constructs, if we're going to actually do things which are ethical, effective, and, and things we're proud of, is, is that we understand that within any one of these disciplines, but I'm singling out AI against all the others because that's where the spotlight is right now, not because it's more important, just because it's getting more attention and there's too much energy dragging in that direction that could risk skewing the balance of the ecosystem. But the AI people have to understand the relevance of the other disciplines to their own success, and they its. And, and, and this is, an, it's really critical that within our education, within our organizations, and funding and everything, that we absolutely try to keep that in mind in, to maintain balance. And, and that, it seems to me um, going off in the extreme is not, um, the, the right way to go. And, and based on the fact that I do mountain climbing, it's, it's weird, even if I'm, if I'm saying that about you should avoid some risk, it's not a, it, it might take something. So 
that's the person side. This, this, uh, the, but now let's look at the technology, about the 360 there, and what, what happens here. So, um, put really clearly, if you're driving your car and texting on your phone using a touch screen and your eye, eyes on and fingers on, you should lose your driver's license. That's just violates every, um, the, the moral order of, of anything. Of, I, I, it's hard to imagine a, a situation where that's, if you're actually driving the car, that kid's going to be gone. In Canada, kids play ice, uh, you know, ball hockey in the streets. So you have to have a speech system there, for example, or find some other alternative if you're going to have any, any interaction with that device or, or that, the, what that device enables. On the other hand, this is the everything's best for something and worse for something else. Example, on the technological side, if she's sending a memo to Satya Nadella about something that's going to affect the share price of Microsoft by 10% in the next 24 hours if it got public, and she's landing in San Jose Airport and, and leaving a voice message, she should lose her job, right? Lose your driver's license if you don't use speech, lose your job if you do use speech. And I want to make absolutely clear, it makes no difference how good the AI is or how good the speech understanding is or, or, the, or any of the other components of the system. Because all of those technological concerns are completely blanked out by the moral order and, and, and of, of, of location. This comes back to what I talked about two years ago about ubiety and the importance of place and context. But of course, the more you can define the place and context, the easier it is to understand the moral order, and therefore it's uh, all the easier to uh, design a system which can intelligently adapt to that context and do that dynamically. Hey, but, Bill, yeah? Do you think it's ethical for a passenger in a vehicle to text while driving? Well, for the passenger to text while a... Uh, I'm sorry, to a passenger to text while a passenger. Oh, I... I think it, um, it can be, yes, if I'm trying to find out uh, if you're giving me directions so that you can actually be my surrogate. Because if I'm allowed to talk to you, that could be, but it depends when. Because if you're the passenger, you have a clear awareness of what's in front of me. You have the same visual field. So if I stop talking, I don't have to ask you to shut up because you see the kid running out in front or you see the, the, the car in front of me skid or somebody doing something stupid. To tell you how bounded it is, but even in those... Show it's just as dangerous to talk on the phone or to talk to a passenger. Oh, it's, no, it's not. The it's the passenger interrupting the driver. They don't, they are not as sensitive to the outside as you. No, 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 I, I'm, the, it, and, then, and it also depends whether in the front or back seat, even. But I, the issue, the issue is, is that driver distraction is a real issue. Um, the fact that John Sanders is still alive is amazing. Um, but the, uh, but the, but the thing uh, is that leaving that part away, because I, because I read Don's book if you want to go to that issue, uh, um, but the, is this, even if they're giving you perfect spoken instructions on your turn by turn from the computer, the computer has no idea what else is going along. It has no idea whether you're in the middle of a conversation. On things which are not urgent, but it's going to say, hey, I'm still here, it doesn't listen. Tell me again that's intelligent. It is in the micro sense, maybe. It's got some degree of something that might be called intelligence. But, but it, again, it's bounded. And unless you define the boundaries of that, you're, you're, you're missing, you're going to um, start you know, breathing your own smoke. So this is. Um, one of the smart speakers, this is from Harman Kardon, it's one that's running Cortana, it's a Microsoft, but every company, Amazon, Apple's, I guess, is doing one, and it, it doesn't matter. It, this could be an echo. It's independent of that. I just want to make an observation that here's this thing in the home that you can speak to in spoken language, and they can turn on your lights and do some things, and in some cases you can do shopping, you can do searches, and so on. And here's a person in the background on a laptop that happens to be running Windows 10, let's pretend, and it's using the accessibility option so that you can actually drive your computer if you have no arms, if you're quadriplegic. You can do everything you can do with a mouse you can do through speech. They're both speech-driven, 
They're both talking to Windows 10, and they're both, for example, pretend using a Cortana. Um, so let's do what we have to do to understand the bound of this is drill down and find out where are the dimensions of differentiation that might affect design or how, how we think about these things. What happens when you're talking, this, the example I want to do is I want to leave a memo and I'm using this version. And by the way, if you have a Windows computer, I highly encourage you to turn that on and just to experience it. Because how do you do experience design if you haven't curated the broadest and richest uh, palette of experiences of your own? as opposed to reading about them. It's, I, want, I want the true on visceral experience. Do it for a day and pretend you're a paraplegic. And just, just try it. It's there on every machine. It has been for years. And, and you'll see um, some interesting things, which will become clear here if you compare this situation where you're having the, the conversation. Now, a lot of this has to do with legacy, which you cannot ignore because uh, refactoring is really hard, and, and you can't just wave through that. You understand, there's 3,000 programmers working on Windows, for example, at order. It's, it's not tiny. Um, but here's the text, and you don't have to read it, but that is the text. It says, uh, lest we get carried away by the hype, blah, blah, blah. But, but look what's actually happening here conceptually. In this speech model, you're talking to the ribbon. You're basically using your voice as a proxy for a mouse. Uh, select the font, now hit that menu, drop that menu down, now select uh, Helvetica, now come down, point here, select, and all this up. Incredibly verbose and so on and so forth. It works, you can splice it on, it's lipstick on the pig. And, and now, look at this case, what, if you're using this, you have a completely different set of expectations. You're going to dictate the way that you would dictate uh, a memo uh, if, if you had a, 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 a stenographer to just take notes. Just sort of say, okay, well, uh, let's uh, move this down. Uh, okay, new paragraph. Okay, put this in italics, and, and, and they would be able to take all that. Now, that is not how it works, but, you, if, but if you can do this, why don't I just bypass that and go straight there from here so I have some consistency? And that's a really interesting question. Should we or shouldn't we? When? And because this isn't just about AI, uh, one of the things I do a lot of work with, and I'm on the corporate advisory board about accessibility, um, being able to access technology, uh, even if you have a desktop in that, um, if you're quadriplegic um, or ALS or whatever, is really important to have other modalities to actually interact with these things. And how do you take that into account? And, and how do you do it in a way that you don't have to maintain all these different things and have all these different speech groups? And can you find, if you go to the right level of abstraction, a way and by the way, one of the one word, words for design is compromise. How do you find the most appropriate compromise to, to that gets, is not necessarily ideal for any one thing, but, but manages to deliver the best value? But these are just kinds of questions that, that are tackling us. And so in that situation, you have this the poor user. If they, uh, there's, they're sort of torn between the, these two completely different, it's the same modalities of the same operating system, but one's command and control and the other's conversational. And how do you reconcile that? And I think that the challenge, of course, is how do you do it in sort of a way that each is standing on the shoulders of the other, and there's some relationship between the two. There's really, and it, it's on a case-by-case -case decision whether they should be separate or whether they should be the same. You don't want everything to be the same with the same interface. Putting live tiles, like Microsoft did for a while, on every form factor, making everything look the same, gives you, guarantees you a weak general system that gets the lowest common denominator as opposed to let you play each instrument in the most, or technology in the most idiomatic way and plays to the strengths of each. How do you build that? And basically to paraphrase Kant Kranzberg's first law, which we will visit if you don't know it in a moment, is consistency per se is neither good nor bad, nor is it neutral. Everybody talks about you need consistent interfaces and consistent design. But the important thing is, do you mean graphical consistency? Or you copy everything exactly the same? Or do you mean you're consistent with expectations and consistent with the moral order or what the resources that are there at the time? Yes, I spent some time as a professional musician composing and writing. If I, you know, if you ever try transcribing piano music for instruments, you will write the notes differently, phrase them differently. To get the same effect, you have to write different uh, parts and so on and so forth. You have to adapt to the idiom. 
And if you don't know any idiom, you only know depending on the, of the nature of the piece and where it's being held, uh, you're playing it. And, and so you sort of say, let me give you an example about consistency, which you don't even notice as consistency. And I think I touched on this example last year, but I'll do it slightly differently. That when you get in your car, and by the way, I like using the word language of, of sociology rather than technology. So let's have a human-centered thing. Don't talk about pairing your phone. Talk about establishing a kinship with your phone and the car. And I mean that because that brings a whole bunch of meta knowledge, which is really important. Because if, I, if that is a rental car, I still want it to be able to let me use my phone and have the voice activated stuff, but I sure be, want to establish a different level of kinship, independent of Bluetooth, so that I don't leave my bloody um, uh, address book and all my data in, back in the car. How many people have rented cars and found just a huge data bank of other people's uh, private information? I, and, and how many people trust it? Or, and the car companies never even think about it because they're not thinking bounded. They're thinking it's private ownership. You see why kinship is a better word? Because then it says what kind of kinship. And, and, and then we confuse the technology, which is the means, with the intent, which is to establish kinship. And, th and again, try to have human-centered of things. There's a large vocabulary from social science that help us understand and discuss the society of technologies. And, and so we come down here is to say, um, oh, I forgot the one other part of that example. I got carried away, uncharacteristically. Um, <laughs> the point is, is that when you get in the car and you put your mobile on the passenger seat and you're driving along, and a text comes in or a call comes in, and you're talking to my son, for example, and I'm, I'm talking to my son and I'm driving. Um, this, it'll take Don's premise, it's, it's just as safe or just as dangerous to talk to him sitting on the car seat through a phone or live. Let's, be, let's just take that as, as, a, as a hypothesis, okay? The where's the phone? And the answer is the two have aggregated and it's not about the phone. Um, you cannot separate. And in fact, of the handset and the car seat, only 10% at most of that is technology is being used. The Bluetooth, the, uh, the SIM chip, a bit of battery and logic, everything else is in the car. And, and the second thing is, the interaction language has had 100% change. It is now absolutely not hands-on, eyes-on, it's completely voice and one or two buttons over here. And the amazing thing, is that when I stop the car, I'm in the middle of the conversation, turn off the car, pick up the phone, I go like this and keep walking along. I smile every time that happens because I say, man, there's been a 100% change in interaction language, a 90% change in techno local technology management call, and because of those two huge inconsistencies, I have complete consistency of conversation. And that's the only consistency that matters. And I don't even notice that, that I can't play Angry Birds or do solitaire or, or do a spreadsheet while I'm driving, even though those apps are on the phone. Nobody misses. And that's how you manage the complexity, because you only expose what's appropriate to the moral order of, of the context. Again, you buy it. So the only, this is the old Proustian uh, interlude of, you know, this notion that the only true voyage of discovery isn't to go to new places, but to have other eyes. And through the uses of language and some of these other metaphors, just like, a kinship, we start to change our way of thinking. Uh, in computer science, um, um, Ken Iverson won the Turing Award, and his, his essay was actually really interesting. His, his Turing Award lecture was called Notation is a Tool of Thought. You know, it just falls back into the old topic got language, language got thought, and that sort of stuff. And it's, and it's really clear. How we speak is really important to communicate some of these things. And one of the things I say is design this choice, and we've got a couple things here that are critical. There's two places where we can exercise creativity and maybe only two places. And one is enumerating the scope within which we select meaningfully distinct alternatives to choose from. So it's the enumeration and expansion phase of design. The world is my oyster, I've got all these possibilities, and, and of course you have to know what constitutes meaningfully distinct. How do I, uh, how do I do, decide that? And, and that scope is the part, because that is what controls the bounding issues of the limited intelligence or the limited limitations of the design. And the second is the heuristics according to which we make the choices. And, and again, this is why you need that broad base of experience, because that, that is the only hope we have or to reliably 
um, try and get the maximum bounding within the means available at that particular point in history and, and uh, of our understanding and, and technology and so on. But let's look where we are in terms of um, silos. We have, um, we have, we're getting, compared to 10, even 10 years ago, the ability to speak and have uh, the syntactic, and, and have what, what would, is any reasonable person would call understanding within the limited domains, it's pretty amazing, the progress, and, and in prosody and everything. But here's this, the AI, and speech understanding and language systems is not design, it isn't HCI. It's a seriously hard problem that it, it in computational linguistics and hiding or pretending to be a panacea in design. All we have to do is talk to our computers. This has been, for the whole time I've been in the world, uh, 45 years of this field, Don's, we will concede, it has always been, if all you have to do is just make everything so you can speak like a person and everything, all your problems will be solved. That is absolutely not true. I mean, first of all, you have to be able to shoot these things down and have the answers right away. Look at this. This is Service Hub. It's an 84 inch uh, touchscreen pen thing. It's collaborative whiteboard and so on and so forth. I don't care what major player you are, in speech recognition, to my knowledge, and I've looked fairly carefully, and I would welcome to be corrected, there's not a single one which is capable of you walking up to the same computer, running the speech recognition, running the same operating system, and going from speech to saying, what is that? Or you can use a dictic gesture to indicate a directional pronoun. You cannot resolve that, there, them. And if you can't do that, I'm sorry. And the problem, you, you, you aren't doing design because that says, oh yeah, when I'm walking around myself, I can bob away and get to have this chat bot that I can speak to. But the minute I get up to the other things in the ecosystem and carry the task with me, I can't do that. Now the thing that really drives me crazy about this is 1978, Dick Bolt and, and, and his students at, at, at was then called the Architecture Machine Group, had this thing called Put That There. And you literally could do that with speech and gesture and not even contact. You don't even need a touch screen. Now when I talk to people in AI about this, what they say, oh great, well we're going to work on that. We're actually going to put a camera on the front. We're going to be able to recognize your gestures and stuff like that. No, shut up and listen. That's our computer. That's our touch screen. If you can't do it on a two-dimensional thing on a touch screen, then what, don't, you know, if you want to just play with the image processing, that's fine, but don't pretend you're solving my problem. You're trying to fly before you can even crawl. I just want to do that. And it's not in the underlying language model. It's not a simple matter of programming just to change those things. And so there's a case where having the distance from design, if you know the history of, of this work, then you're going to be able to bring that in, not in an aggressive way, but in a constructive way to help raise the state of the game so because the further you go in the silo the more expensive it is to refactor and and what's interesting about this in 1978 you can talk to Chris Schmatt about it because it's pretty funny first of all go to put that there on YouTube watch the video I think the video was shot in 78 Every piece of technology was over-the-counter purchased they didn't build anything they just glued stuff together with bubble gum the rear projection, it cost a fortune. I guess DARPA had a lot of money in those days. But the, because it was like for command and control systems. It worked. Super limited vocabulary. It limped. Um, it took multiple takes to get enough shots to glue that video together. Okay, but nobody in the language community really knows about that work because it was never, Dick was never taken seriously. He was an interesting guy, but, but that was, and, and so he didn't fit in. And, but the point is, the lesson there is what's important, not the technology. And, and I can't talk without using my hands. It, it's just, it, it's those types of huge holes which are going to come and bite us really hard if we don't do our business in the larger um, holistic view that I, I started talking about. But I'll give you some other examples about, this comes down to the part of, on intelligence, is that um, 
here's somebody coming out of a Staples store. Now, when you're walking out of a supermarket, it, it's a fair assumption that you might have your arms full of groceries or you might be, have a cart. In either case, you, you have to do something like that or bash it and, and push. That's called task interference. How do you push these secondary tasks into the background so they are, in fact, automated, so that I can pursue my primary task, get the groceries or the shopping to the car, into the car, as efficiently as possible? That's not making you stupid. That's making the environment smart in terms of reactive to the case. Now, it turns out that those automated doors, uh, this, this one, it's basically connect to 0.001. Um, the first one I can find in North America where these automated doors uh, was out in, in Wilcox's Pier Restaurant in West Haven, Connecticut in 1931. This is the kind of trivia you, you hook people, oh, that's an interesting piece of information. We can use that in a trivia game. But this is the best one. Heron of Alexandria did it in the first century, so some kind of water-controlled automatic door that opened. Uh, so I'm told, so my research tells me. So, uh, um, so there's a long, long nose uh, to this particular piece of technology. Now, let's take another example. Your car. Okay, it's Ford Escape. I actually own that model of Ford Escape. Let's say it costs $30,000. Okay. How many people have personally bought a $10,000 PC with your own money? Because you have a car. Because you have a car. One third of the cost of any vehicle since even before 2010 was in the infrastructure. And by the way, I know these things because every car you own was designed with software that came out of uh, my last shop. Alias has, or what's now Autodesk Studio, has 100% market share in car design and has for 20 years, plus years. And I probably know the designer of your car. Now, it has all the buzzwords and has for over decades. My wife has a 2010 RAV4, Toyota. Walk the dog past at night, the car lights up as she passes by. It has that awareness. It has a camera in the back. It has keyless entry. My Ford Escape has, and most of your cars, if they're less than five years old, have a trunk or a, a gate at the back that can open under, you can just click a button and the gate will open automatically and close automatically. They have LiDAR or other types of sensors to sense uh, things around the periphery. That's what they use for backing up. They have high resolution cameras that can see you. They have a key fob with a keyless entry that lets you, all, these, all of these things. So you're walking out, it's icy. You're in Canada, you got paper bag groceries because you're eco, <laughs> and you're standing like that, and your keys are in your purse. Ford has a great solution. You do that, <laughs> which is going to land you flat on your butt, <laughs> right? But why would that be necessary? It has a GPS system. The GPS system knows it's at a supermarket. It knows it's your car. It knows it's you behind it because it can do have all these things. The, it, the key fob's telling it which door you're at because that, that actually does work. It only op if you grab the thing, it will open only the doors if you're there, if it's locked, if you have the fob. And all these other things, all this AI, all of this potential, $10,000 of compute power with ambient intelligence and, 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 and sensor networks, and it won't open the door. Yes, yes, that is not a fake picture. That is a feature. Come on, what, don't you understand features? What's wrong with you? Really? Yeah. It's very common. Yeah, okay, so the thing is this. That's your car. That's not your supermarket. And that door is not in a bank vault where it would not be a very, you wouldn't keep your money in the bank if it had an automatic in and out door. And so I want to ask you, this is a one bit computer with virtually no memory, an input device and an output device, a motor and a sensor, and this is $10,000 of the latest technology with a lot of AI. Which is the more intelligent system? Right? Okay. That, orders of magnitude for this particular transaction, that can't guide you to get from here to my hotel or back. 
but it can open the door when I need it opened in the background and not and avoid the task interference. And it only can do that because it knows its place. And the intelligence is the intelligence of the person who invented it and put it there in that location at that time during those, off, during those particular hours. This thing has huge potential, but everybody designed the components in these little silos and didn't think about what their kinships were and what the transactions were because they were thinking narrow. The problem is groceries from the counter into the car. Now, if you think skill is important, and this is like Anderson, or also this whole notion of chunking and this notion of aggregation as a notion of skill, cognitive or otherwise, they stopped at, at, a, at a low level subtree instead of going up in terms of transaction. What is the high order bit in terms of this overall encompassing transaction? And that, and, and there, everything you know about skill acquisition can apply to how we think about doing this type of thing. And it's more important because here's the important thing. Your customers, our users, do not give a care in the world for whether there's AI in your system. They just want things to behave in a reasonable, intelligent way and not, uh, and where it gives you emotional, <coughs> positive feedback and so on and so forth. That's intelligence. And that means adaptivity. So where does intelligence live this line? And I'd argue, what I'm gonna argue now is that basically most of AI is notion of intelligence is at least 50 years old. And it's kind of this brain in a bottle um, uh, version that it's sort of like, it's, I could start with this and be more, this one here just to be, we use our language, what a brainer, what a head and the shoulders, that sort of stuff to say how smart people are. The assumption implicitly in that kind of conversation says, this is where all the intelligence lies. I just cracks me up when I read about somebody, a neuroscientist who's put somebody into a, a CAT scan and measure and say, hey, this is where creativity happens. How can you be creative when you're in the middle of a CAT scan or, or, or laugh at jokes? But the point is, is that, um, you know, there's nobody to make funny faces, but if we, but that's more of what's really happening. And, and so it's, to a large extent, it's, it's missing the whole part of embodied intelligence. You know, you sort of say, well, how can you understand that rock without feeling it? But it's even more, how can you understand that if you know that my friend Henry picked it up in the uh, uh, Camino Santiago in, in, on, on the pilgrimage and brought it back as a gift to me of a sort of symbolic thing. It has all this emotional stuff to it, too. How could that knowledge be there or know anything about it? And, and this, uh, Frank Wilson had this great thing in his book. He said, Argue, any theory of, of human intelligence which ignores the independence of hand and brain function the historic origins of which, you know, you can read it yourself, is, is trivial. This motor memory and this stuff is really, in terms of body intelligence, really interesting. I had a hip replacement. Only had one. The thing about it is, that I, this is what I want to talk to you about, we talked about at dinner, but strange thing happened. I was fit enough, I working on crutches, trying to get mobile again. I forgot, my leg forgot how to walk. I could put weight on it. I could tell my brain to move it, and it would move all the connections to the brain and the leg were there. But I, could, I don't know how to do it, because I've never thought about it, because it's been automatic since I was one year old. And I'm 69, uh, 67 when that happened. So what I had to do, luckily we have two legs. I'd sit with my crutches and I'd study this foot movement, and then I'd try and copy mentally in, in, in controlled, attentive behavior, till I finally retrained it. But it's really funny, but I lost my memory. But the motor, I lost the muscle memory. This is where you can tell you later that this is nuts, but it's really weird. It was, it was this funny thing. You have to get a hip replacement to become a good designer, because it's all about curating experience design, right? <laughs> to have that experience, it was kind of neat. But, but we come back here to, to this, uh, this, this, <coughs> this institute, is that that's not even enough, embodied isn't enough. If you don't go into extended intelligence, you're missing the boat. And this is why I keep coming back to this notion of ubiety, that the intelligence lies throughout, not just in the mind, it, it exists in the social structure. If you're in a commercial versus a Navy ship, the social structure is gonna be different, so there's a different kind of intelligence. And this is where we start to go. And the framing, this is just another layer on the Russian dolls, that how further we go out and out and out, and that's where the intelligence is embodied. 
And so we have to use this term intelligent, intelligence intelligently and, and understand where we sit. And so this is just telling me I'm out of time, so I guess it's going to just keep flipping through for some weird reason. But the, stop this. That's pretty funny. See, there's, I'm talking about AI and it's a computer and it's hearing me and it's sort of saying, okay, I'm going to get you for that. Um, Um, it's, yes, so you know what? I don't have to do that. <laughs> they, so this is, comes back to, but let's come back to, let's think about different types of intelligence. And I know that Piaget's theories about child development and social development psychology are kind of dated. But this definition that he has about intelligence as the ability of an organism to adapt to the change of environment through a dual process of accommodation and assimilation seems to me a pretty appropriate uh, short definition of a relevant way to think about AI from the perspective of design. And the key words there are adaptation and change because that implies mobility, movement. Either, and I don't just mean physical movement, but conceptual movement, social movement, um, physical movement. And that means from place to place. That means it's about transitions. It means that you have to be aware of the transitions and the resources that are available during that transition. I didn't mention in the car. Well, while driving in the car and being overwhelmed and about how smiley I am when I, how happy I am when I pick the phone up off the seat and get out and, and speak and the, everything, the transition is beautiful. How many of you, when you're driving down the freeway, are just flabbergasted by the fact? that your call is being handed off from cell tower to cell tower to cell tower to cell tower. That is more magic than anything. And how does it do that? And by the way, the first cellular phone call was done in 1978. It wasn't actually, it was a prototype because it only had a couple cells. The first, it took 10 years to build out the infrastructure, even in a limited area, till, till 88 before you could actually deploy cell towers because you needed the towers and the handoff mechanism, the infrastructure, and that build that ecosystem out. Now, if you could do it with that at those prices, why can't we do it within the devices that we have right now so that as I move through my human and digital, this mixed ecosystem, that I can't have the same kind of handoff that I've already experienced in my car with my phone in terms of the adaptation there. And, and with the larger things when I walk into my headset talking and then come up to my Surface Hub and then start to carry the work with me and have the work transfer over that way. They don't have to be a homogenous set of technologies. They can be heterogeneous technologies. You can still have those transfers. Conceptually, you can't do that today. But why would we try to solve problems that we can do today as opposed to get a vision of where we're going so we can work backwards from there and figure out what does it take to get from here from there? Because that's what design is about. How do you get there from here? But if you don't know where you're going, everywhere's the right direction. And, and so this stuff's possible. It's hard, but if you want to get paid, you know what? You got to work for it. And that's the best part. We have, we're lucky. I lived in France in 60, um, was it 67, 68, during the, the strike, the general strike. Was it 68, I think? And everybody's on strike. You know, the man is exploiting the workers. We're going on strike, Our, we're, we're being exploited. We live in one of the luckiest, not a bubble, but we're lucky because everyone in this room, just by virtue of being here, I know this, you go on strike if they're not exploiting the skills. You worked so hard to get really good at what you do, we all did, that the biggest insult is not to take advantage of it. That more than money will make me leave any company. And and because of that, this is not the only problem out there. But we realize it's not about artificial intelligence. It's about intelligence in general of how we conceptualize, how we design systems. But what I hope I've communicated is also how we manage ourselves and our organizations so that we are best equipped to talk, think, and address these questions. And I can't think of anything more worthy 
And the most important step is, who else do we need in the team? Because you just can't do it alone. Okay, thank you.